Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode from my dining room studio into wherever you are. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about the fact that um, we've all seen Jehovah's Witnesses preaching from door to door or certainly heard about it. Lately, we've been seeing more and more of them standing beside literature carts in various places. And, you know, their magazine, their, their latest watchtower, I notice, says that they print over 61 million copies of each one in 294 languages. So it's certainly very impressive to see what they are doing. In fact, they believe that, if nothing else, the fact that they are preaching this message proves to them that they are God's organization. So the question is then, well, what are they preaching? What were they preaching before? What are they preaching now? And if you've watched any of my previous videos, you would have seen that uh, one thing that I have highlighted is the fact that they have been preaching the wrong message with the wrong date for over a hundred years. In fact, I've done a little summary here for you to have a look at. So I've just put together what the message is that they've been saying since the beginning of time, starting with Charles Russell and how he would said that the end would come in 1914. But then, of course, when it didn't come, then it was the generation of 1914. It wouldn't die. Then we have Rutherford saying similar things. President Knorr. We've had President Franz, President Henschel. They all were saying this, but then if, and they even put it on the front of a Watchtower magazine to show that this generation, you know, would not die. Well, as time continued to march forward, we realized that this generation did die. But instead of admitting that they were wrong, they now say that, no, we weren't wrong. The generation just overlaps. So obviously it matters what your message is. If you choose to call yourself God's organization, then the message should be the right message, not just whatever you feel like you want to preach at that time. If you were to ask a Jehovah's Witness what they preach, they would say that they preach about God's kingdom. They would say that those who are faithful will live in a paradise earth, and those who are wicked will be destroyed at Armageddon. They will also tell you that through their preaching work, they are making known the name Jehovah. After all, they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. When you speak with one of them, they will tell you that all their beliefs are based on the Bible. But once I really started researching their doctrines, I came to realize that so much of it was actually not based on the Bible at all, but it was based on man-made thinking that they just made up as they went along. It sounds shocking, I'm, I'm sure, because uh, it shocked me the more I researched and the more I found out. But let's first of all start our video today with the name Jehovah. Now, is this a name that you would find in the Christian Greek scriptures or the New Testament? Did God ensure that his name was included? Well, let's have a look at one of their publications. It's the Divine Name Brochure. It shows there that apart from an abbreviated form, Jah, no ancient Greek manuscript that we possess today of the books from Matthew to Revelation contains God's name in full. So they admit that it's not in the New Testament even once. Out of the thousands of manuscripts that we have, we can't find one instance where God put the name Jehovah in the New Testament. You know, let's just reason on that for a second. God didn't see fit to put the name Jehovah in the New Testament. It says something, doesn't it? Well, then, did Jesus use the name? No, he didn't. He called God his father. Which personally, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of people, is actually much more respectful and much more endearing. When my little son calls me mummy, it makes me feel really good. When he calls me Susan, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> Jesus too showed respect for his father. Is Jehovah the correct pronunciation for the divine name? No. Let's see more of this quote from Governing Body member Jeffrey Jackson from a JW Broadcasting episode. Another reason often given by translators for not using God's name in the text of their translations is that they don't know the exact pronunciation of the original name. Some scholars feel that the original pronunciation was closer to Yahweh rather than Jehovah. Not just some scholars, pretty much every single one.
Others feel that it may have been Yehovah. Just how important is the exact pronunciation of the original Hebrew name? Could we get sidetracked by trying to determine what that pronunciation was? Well, first of all, let's establish why we use the pronunciation Jehovah in English. Is it because the closest, it's the closest pronunciation to the original? No. We use the name Jehovah because it's widely recognized in English. Is this a reasonable position to take? Yes. So he admits that the divine name isn't pronounced Jehovah, but something more like Yahweh. And the reason given for why they used Jehovah is because it was so widely known. And the reason why it was widely known was because of the world who made it widely known. You know, since when does the Jehovah's Witness organization copy the world? Since when do they say, well, the world calls it this, so we'll call it that too? <laughs> I'm not objecting to the name Jehovah at all. I know people are going to say, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses are going to say, well, you know, Satan hates the name Jehovah. And if Susan's not using it, then she's in cahoots with the devil or something, or it makes me an apostate. But I have no problem with the name Jehovah at all. In fact, I loved the name for 30 years of my life. I was taught, you know, to love this name. And I certainly don't have a problem with it. But just because I don't use it in every second sentence the way Jehovah's Witnesses do, doesn't mean I don't appreciate the name. I mean, Jesus Christ didn't use the name at all. <laughs> so he's not an apostate. I'm sure Jehovah's Witnesses would never argue that Jesus is an apostate. But it's awfully strange that, that this is their line of reasoning. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, when you really start to review the matter here, the name about the name Jehovah. Let's just get everything straight here. So God never saw fit to put the name Jehovah in the New Testament. Jesus nor any of his followers did not use it according to the Bible because it's not once recorded for us to see. So he didn't use the name. It's not even pronounced Jehovah, but something more like Yahweh. And they only call him Jehovah because the world made that name known. So they decided that, you know, let's call him Jehovah as well. You know, and yet they've decided presumptuously to add it to the scriptures. You know, like as if maybe God forgot to put it there. So, you know, we should put it in there because God obviously forgot to put it in there or God, you know, for whatever reason, didn't put it in there, but it should be there because we feel it should be there. And no, Jesus didn't use it, but we feel he should. <laughs> like they like they know more than God and they know more than Jesus because we know they love to speak for them. So here you've got these ants on earth, basically telling, you know, our father in heaven what he should be doing. I guess they see themselves more righteous than Jesus and even God himself. Yes. The organization has its followers preach about an earthly paradise. They tell us that Jesus is not the mediator for us, but only for them, and only just a select few of them. <laughs> they also tell us that we must refuse to drink the wine that symbolizes Jesus' blood, and we must refuse to eat the bread that symbolizes his body, even though Jesus commanded his followers to do this to gain life. This is a screen save from the JW Org website. We see it's from John chapter 6 and verse 52. And I'm just going to read portions of those verses that I've highlighted there. Jesus is saying, Most truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has everlasting life, and I will resurrect him on the last day. Okay, so again, verse 57, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. So Jesus says to do this, but the men who make up their governing body say not to. So what do JWs do? They follow the men who make up their governing body and refuse to listen to what Jesus said to do. So every year when they have their memorial celebration, they simply pass these emblems. They're offered them. Do you want to drink? Do you want to eat as Jesus commanded? No, they push them away. Why? Because the men who make up their governing body say to do it. So they follow the men.
They believe that they're going to live forever on earth. Is this what the Bible teaches? Matthew 8 verse 11, it says, But I tell you that many from eastern parts and western parts will come and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of the heavens. Matthew 5 verses 11 to 12 talks about how your reward is great in the heavens, for in that way they persecuted the prophets prior to you. And then Hebrews chapter 11, which is the chapter that talks about all the faithful ones of old, it's, it talks about here how they never received the, the fulfillment of the promises. And at the end there it says, But now they are reaching out for a better place, that is, one belonging to heaven. Hence God is not ashamed of them to be called upon as their God, for he has made a city ready for them. And this here I got from jwfacts.com. It says there, The Bible never promises an earthly resurrection. The Old Testament is vague about life after death neither specifying a resurrection nor defining the afterlife. Throughout the New Testament, the resurrection is heavenly. The Bible promises there is but one hope for Christ's followers. And you can see this there at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, One body there is and one spirit, even as you were called in the one hope to which you were called. And the 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 talks about this, For truly by one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink one spirit. And then we see here again at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised up in incorruption. Sown a physical body, raised up a spiritual body. We shall bear also the image of the heavenly one. However, this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit God's kingdom, neither does corruption, inherit incorruption. So as we can see, the Bible shows that there is just one hope for mankind. But J.W. Ork says that there are two hopes. Because they've created this secondary hope, they've now had to rethink the fact about Jesus being the mediator. And this is why they come up with the lie where they say that Jesus is not the mediator for all mankind the way the Bible says, but they say he's just the mediator for them and just a select few of them. I try and include this slide in all of my videos because <laughs> it's such a keeper. We have the quote there from 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, a man, Christ Jesus. But J.W. Ork says Jesus Christ is not the mediator between Jehovah God and all mankind. He's a mediator between his heavenly father, Jehovah God, and the nation of spiritual Israel, which is limited to only 144,000 members. So Jesus says that he is our mediator, but J.W. Org says that he is not our mediator. So what do the members of this organization do? Do they follow Jesus? No. They listen to what the men of the governing body say. And I just have to add that this is an example of what a cult does. People say to me, oh, why do you believe that Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult? Well, there's many reasons. This is just one of, of the many reasons, but it's a very important one to take note of. A cult has to find a way to make themselves equal to God or equal to Christ in this case. Because if they don't have that, then there's no reason for them, right? There's no reason to give any honor or glory to them. So you see, they have very cleverly pushed Jesus out of the picture because he's not your mediator, you see? So the mediator becomes who? The governing body. They actually say you have to go through them to get to Christ, to get to God. It's sick, isn't it? It's sick and demented. But this is the kind of thing that a cult does. They need you to make them equal to God or Christ. And this is how they did it. The Bible also says that we must be born again. John chapter 3 verse 3, where Jesus says, Unless anyone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4, it says that he gave us a new birth. It is reserved in the heavens for you. But J.W. Orr disagrees with this. They do not agree that this applies to you and me, but only to a select few of them. If you want to do more research on whether or not there's an earthly hope or on some of the things that we've discussed here in today's show, 
I really invite you to go check out jwfacts.com. A lot of the information I got from there, and he has some fantastic information that would really help in your personal research. So I'm going to include a link in the description of this video below. As mentioned before and in earlier videos of mine, we know the JW Org has erroneously preached that the end was going to come in 1914, 1925, 1975, before the generation that saw 1914 died out, etc. They've done this in a cry-wolf fashion where most people can no longer take them seriously anymore, demonstrating that God was never with them, as he could never support false teachings and lies. So the organization refuses to accept the fact that that generation of 1914 did die. Instead, instead of admitting to that, to what's obvious to everybody, they're saying that it actually overlaps. <laughs> so now they're clinging on to this 1914 generation that they seem to be married to and say that it overlaps, something that is completely unfounded in any scripture. But I guess it enables them to desperately hang on to something that clearly was never right to begin with. But, you know, the overlapping generation teaching is so, I don't know, convoluted and so messed up that when governing body member David Splain tried to explain it to everybody, he needed to use flip charts. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus using flip charts to explain his teachings? He didn't need to because it was simple and it made sense. And yes, that is a picture of Stephen Light in the front there laughing at it all. I didn't create this picture. I wish I knew who did, but it just underscores how insane the whole thing is. They preach that Jesus selected their organization in 1919, but where it, does it say this in the Bible? And where is the evidence to support such a huge claim? <laughs> they also say that the 144,000 that is mentioned in Revelation is a literal number, even though, as we see here, that everything mentioned in those verses is figurative. Yet they argue the number somehow is literal. They've had to repeatedly change their beliefs as time proved their beliefs to be false. Many people have laughed at them, as we see from this old publication here. It says all of the Lord's people looked forward to 1914 with joyful expectation. When that time came and passed, there was much disappointment, chagrin and mourning, and the Lord's people were greatly in reproach. They were ridiculed by the clergy and their allies in particular, and pointed to with scorn because they had said so much about 1914 and what would come to pass, and their prophecies had not been fulfilled. People laugh at them today too, but J.W. Org calls it persecution. <laughs> but you know, this is the history of the organization. They give you a promise that is not founded on the scriptures, and they give you a date, and then what? Nothing happens. So you're led to just disappointment and broken dreams and broken promises and broken families, and it just perpetuates. It's awful. It also happened with their president, Rutherford, with what he said about 1925. Look what their president, Franz, said that President Rutherford had to say about himself and all his false promises regarding 1925. He did make an ass of himself. He made a gigantic ass of himself. <laughs> and this was only referring to his lies regarding 1925. You know, the millions now living will never die thing that he was doing. If you can believe it, it actually gets worse, much, much worse. During World War II, while much of the world was at war and in a very depressed state, Rutherford had the organization build for him a mansion in San Diego, complete with Cadillacs. <laughs> Let's see what he has to say about this. This is from his 1942 book, The New World by Joseph Rutherford. He says there that those faithful men of old may be expected back from the dead any day now. In this expectation, the house at San Diego, California, which house has been much publicized with malicious intent by the religious enemy, was built in 1930 and named Beth Sarim, meaning House of the Princes. It is now held in trust for the occupancy of those princes on their return. And then it talks about how these religionists are gnashing their teeth because of the testimony of this house. <laughs> 
And check out this portion here of the lease as put in the Golden Age magazine from 1930. It's saying, It is further provided that if the said Joseph F. Rutherford, while alive on the earth, shall by lease, deed, or contract provide that any other person or persons connected with the said Watchtower Bible and Tract Society shall have the right to reside on said premises until the appearing of David or some of the other men mentioned in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. <laughs> As above set forth, even such person or persons so designated by the said Joseph F. Rutherford. So basically, whoever Joseph F. Rutherford says can live there, can live there. And if you look towards the end there, the last sentence, any persons appearing to take possession of said premises shall first prove and identify themselves to the proper officer of said society as the person or persons designated, or sorry, described in Hebrews chapter 11 and in this deed. <laughs> so when Moses appears, he'd better have the right credentials. Hi, I'm Moses, you know, or hi, I'm Moses' wife. I'm not named, but I am who I said I am, and you have to be able to prove it. It's just so idiotic. I find it funny. I mean, it's just so hard to believe. And of course, in time, they had to sell this mansion, but not before Rutherford ended up dying there. And not before the world was gnashing its teeth at it, too. <laughs> it reminds me of the scripture in the book of Psalms. Check it out. From Psalm 115, verse 4, it says, Their idols are silver and gold or in this case, blue and white. The work of human hands, a mouth they have, but they cannot speak, eyes, but they cannot see, ears they have, but they cannot hear, and so forth. And then we see in verse eight, the people who make them will become just like them, as will all those who trust in them. So just like their little idol logo, you know, the JW Org logo that they love to slap on everything from Kingdom Halls to their publications, they make empty promises. Promises that they simply cannot keep. And as we read in the scripture there in Psalms, those following these men will become just like them. Dead. Rutherford, Russell, Noor, Franz, Henschel, all dead. And the sad thing is that this organization has profited off of all of these people. They've profited off of their members. And they intend to continue to profit off of the overlapping generation of members that they have now. You know, yes, if you ask people, do Jehovah's Witnesses preach? Yes, they do. They, they, they have a very impressive preaching work. Unfortunately, it's the wrong message. They are not preaching as the way Jesus had instructed them to do. And all they say is, well, we're just like Jesus, you know, early apostles and disciples. No, they're nothing like them. What Jesus' apostles and disciples said came true. Clearly what the witnesses are doing is not right because none of it is coming true. And they have left a long line of broken families and broken dreams, unfulfilled promises and death. The best advice I could give anyone is to get as far away from this organization as possible. Get out of her. You know, it's, it's simply a doom and gloom false organization. And when you do get a, away from it, your life improves immensely. <laughs> so I hope you found this video to be helpful to you. And if you liked it, then like it. And I'll see you all around next time. Thank you.